Good morning, everybody. All right, let's get started. We have uh, two topics to discuss with you today. Uh, as you know, we, we are taking as, as much time as people would like to take explaining parts of the budget. It's a huge deal, uh, and we want to be sure there's every opportunity to understand the basic thrusts of, of what we're attempting to uh, suggest to the people of the city uh, through the budget process. So today we want to address two topics. One, the taking charge uh, budget survey results and also uh, how funds will be used in the upcoming 16 to 18 budget to fix parks and recreation facilities. About time, huh, Lynn? Yeah. Yeah. The taking charge public engagement process has fundamentally altered, as I think you all understand, the conduct of city business during our administration and, and actually during the history of, uh, of the city. Things, things are moving in a new direction. We've started it, we work on it every year, uh, and hopefully we think that that more intense public engagement will become uh, a fact of life in Lincoln uh, going forward. We go to the people of the community to learn more about their aspirations for the future. That's essentially it. The taking charge process has given Lincoln residents a much greater role in the budget decision-making process. By bringing people into the process, we have uh, developed greater community consensus on budget priorities and elevated the community interest above the narrow demands of uh, uh, special interest groups. Taking charge has been instrumental in helping our administration shape our budget proposals. As I crafted uh, the proposed two-year city budget, uh, keeping our community safe continues to be the top community priority. Another top priority is building and maintaining infrastructure that supports growth like streets and water and wastewater. Those programs and departments have been prioritized within my budget proposal. However, there is a third important priority which is taking care of what we have. <clears throat> that involves, uh, as well as the large departments, the remaining city department programs like StarTran, parks, libraries, and aging services. The 2016 Taking Charge pro process focused on those remaining programs. Current programming was reviewed and Lincoln residents were asked to give their opinions on important but lower priority city services. We were also interested in what Lincoln residents thought about future funding needs, such as expanded service at StarTran, a new Bennett Martin Library, and the parks repair and replacement budget. Over 2,300 people took the time to fill out the survey and make their voices heard, and I would like the citizens to know that we are grateful to each and every one of them who took the time to do that. Lisa Picklick Zelig of the University of Nebraska Public Policy Center is here. Come on up here, Lisa. She's our longtime partner. Nice to see you again uh, in the taking charge process. Uh, she, and she's here today to release the results of this year's survey and the results of the community conversation. So why don't you get into that for us, Lisa? Yeah. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the City of Lincoln again for giving residents a, a chance to say their views, and that is exactly what I'm going to talk about today. Big thank you to the um, more than 2,300 people who came to uh, the survey to take the survey. Actually, 100 of those did it on paper. This year, the city uh, released some paper surveys via uh, an insert in the newspaper and uh, by distributing them through the libraries that dealt with the core issues of the survey. Um, this year, uh, we had uh, kind of the typical 
typical uh, set of people come in that, again, we were overrepresenting whites. We'd really like to, this is my poll, again, to go out and get your friends and family to participate. We're always looking for more representation. It was a really good year. This is the second highest turnout we had for the survey. Um, we actually ended up, for the first time, having more women come to the survey than men. That's never happened in a volunteer survey before. Um, but we're still looking for more uh, minorities and a greater range of education levels. Quick overview of what activities were involved this year. This year we had our deliberative survey, which meant that it was a survey. We do ask people kind of for gut impressions, but we also provide a lot of information as question comes up, links to background information and other information about the programs. Uh, people could choose from three areas to give their feedback on, and they could do all three in any order that they wanted, or they could quit after whatever they gave feedback on. Those included current priorities, current programs that were in the budget, um, that they'd like to see prioritized or not prioritized, future priorities, and then city performance. We always give people a chance to just rate the city in terms of how they think they're doing. Um, we give people two different ways to give their input on these priorities. We let them rate them on a scale of one to five from not at all important to very important. That allows people who wish to say that all programs are important or all important programs are not important, a chance to say that. But we also ask them to rank them. That, ask, that activity is designed to ask them to make tough decisions. So yes, you can say they're all equally important, but if push came to shove and you had to choose, we'd like you to rank them and choose them. So we'll have both of those results uh, in the results today. We also had a deliberative discussion. The reason for a deliberative discussion, and we had 58 people come this year, is to try to get more into the reasons that people have for their uh, choices. We always give people a chance to give their reasons for choices in the survey, but sometimes a back and forth dialogue is going to reveal a lot more about those reasons. It gives people a chance to ask city government questions that they have, questions that come up, and to also hear other perspectives from other people in their community about why they value things or don't value things. Um, so into the results, first looking at current priorities, what we see here is a pretty reliable tendency for people to uh, prioritize. This is, these are the survey results, and people were asked, um, again, to rate or rank the importance. Uh, and both the ratings and rankings resulted in snow removal, in-home services for seniors, and neighborhood swimming pools being among the top three. I put those all in a group because you'll see, depending on whether they're rating them or ranking them, there's a slight difference in order. But they still will all end up being in the top three. Uh, parking and abandoned vehicle enforcement, on the other hand, is at the lower end, um, and then you see the ones in between. Pioneers Park was reliably kind of in the second tier, and then the third tier of importance was one day of library service, health information, referral call center, and non-injury traffic accident reporting. So then we went to the community conversation to talk about these things in more depth. You'll see that we gave groups, so we had small groups, and we asked them to try to come to consensus, try to decide as groups how to rate and rank these things. Um, the groups came to a very similar conclusion as the survey. So what that means to us is that if you give people a chance to talk to each other, if you give people a chance to get more information from city officials, they're not really going off and suddenly deciding on different programs. So that's, that's useful to know. We also gave all individuals in any group a chance to do an individual form. That was to take into account the fact that it's hard to come to consensus in only an hour and 45 minutes when you're discussing so many programs. So we wanted to give individuals a chance to to object or to uh, support their group opinions. And what we find there, again, is a very similar top three sort of uh, rating and ranking type of thing. Uh, finally, we had a pre-post type survey. So at the very beginning of the survey and the very end of the survey, we asked people to report their top priority. Um, again, what we see, and this is a chance to tell us both who came to the conversation, because it might not be the same people who came to the conversation as who did the survey, and did their ideas or their priorities change when they left. What we saw actually was an increase in support for in-home services for seniors and no neighborhoods, no removal, and other areas decreased except swimming pools, which again was the top three stated the same level as when people came in. So again, we feel pretty good about our survey results and um, them being supported by the community conversation. 
as far as reasons for, for why people chose these things, people tended to focus on, well, how many people are going to be affected by this program and by its funding? How is this program affecting quality of life? How does it affect our safety in the city? How is it impacting economic concerns and growth? And then um, to what extent is the program serving underserved or underrepresented persons? We also asked people both on the survey and at the community conversation if they went over budget because we gave them a budget of 500000 to spend on their, uh, on their programs and we gave them feedback as to whether or not they stayed within budget and if they decided not to stay in budget we explicitly translated that into well what if property taxes were used to pay for it what would that do to a house that cost about 150000 what we saw uh, when we asked them what to do if they went over was that we saw that most people the majority of people had some sort of uh, willingness to raise taxes. So we had about 45, 46 percent saying just raise taxes and we had an additional almost 10 percent saying either rate, uh, both do some combination of raising taxes and cutting other programs. All right, looking to future investments, uh, the priorities here, the uh, top priorities, uh, both the ratings and rankings converged on the same uh, same ordering of the programs. So what you can see is that parks ended up uh, being at the very top, top rated, top ranked program on average, followed by South Beltway and then StarTran. Um, golf capital replacement and repair was by far the least valued program. Um, when we looked at the community conversation results, what we found was that we did have uh, somewhat different people coming to the conversation than went to the survey. So you'll see that uh, parks ended up being actually behind StarTrand and South Beltway construction among the community participants uh, group decisions and among the individuals who decided to give us their opinions. Um, when you look at the pre-post things, again, you see parks is, is when people are choosing their very top most important program, again, the people who came did not value parks as much, and that's fine, we only had 58 out of the 2,300. Um, what we also saw was that as people discussed things, the only program that really increased in support was StarTran. So something was happening in conversations with their peers and with the government officials saying, we, really, we think StarTran should be funded. Um, in terms of ordering, though, they're all kind of ranked up there. Um, the same reasons were given pretty much in the community conversation uh, for future priorities as for current priorities. Uh, we did see a little bit more uh, discussion of uh, city growth and development, however, in those reasons. And people also talking about kind of absolute cost of programs and whether or not there were other funding sources available. So there were a couple of things where people are like, I don't think there's any other funding for this, so we think the city needs to support it. Um, finally, looking, with re looking at resident satisfaction with the city, and I'm only going to report, uh, I'm going to show it in the context of past satisfaction too, but sticking only to the volunteer survey because random sample surveys and uh, volunteer surveys sometimes differ. Um, what we see is that when we give people a chance to rate from poor to excellent, um, they're hanging out right at about uh, almost like three, which is a good rating. This is actually up significantly from last year and up even more significantly from 2012 when we asked about it. Now, yes, this is a non-representative sample. It's a volunteer sample. However, when we, we do have in last year's report a comparison with the random sample surveys and the same trend is showing where people are increasing. Typically what happens is uh, the people who come to the non-random survey online are less happy. <laughs> People are more motivated by being less happy to come to the survey, so usually they give lower ratings, so the random sample surveys are typically higher. Um, finally, we have six questions that we've shown every, I think every year, and so I've put the last few years that we have, we have them always in the volunteer and the random sample survey, and the city is increasing in all of them. The, the order of the various questions is staying about the same, but the city's increasing on all of them significantly as well. And that's it. You know, maybe before we go on to the other part, Lisa, you want to answer questions, or can we answer questions on this part? So for future um, priorities, you said Star Trend after what it is what the public wants. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate on that more? It says like parks. Sure. 
I'm going to go back to it. Um, so this is from the community conversation. So you see, and when we ask people what their very top priority was, you see that at the beginning we had about 32% of our respondents saying at the community conversation that was their top priority and that increased to 43% by the end. So for the community conversation type participants, let me go back, you'll see that the ranking of StarTran um, among groups fell second most important uh, parks was actually higher for them, for groups. Among individuals, it actually, oh, I'm sorry, parks was lower. South Belt, because these are rankings. So with ratings, you want higher numbers. With raters, rate, rankings, you want lower numbers. So South Beltway was more important than StarTran, um, according to the groups and according to the um, individuals who decided to report back on. Parks ended up being third in this context, but in terms of the uh, future priorities from the 2300 who took the survey, parks were the top priority. One thing that you might note, though, is that there really wasn't a big change in terms of people's valuing, valuing of parks from pre to post. So it's not that our group was getting less enthused with parks. It was more just that we had less park enthusiasts come to our conversation. And with this type of a survey, um, you, can't, you can't state a percentage of accuracy of a reflection in our community, right? Because you don't have to cross sample. Mm -hmm. It's not done. You it's not a... In areas that's totally not scientific and not... Well... It's not that it's totally not uh, scientific, but it is not a random sample survey. So in other words, we don't claim that this is representative of everyone's views, and we certainly know that the community conversation is not representative, which is why we actually see if it's even representative of those who took the survey. So, but what it does do is it, well, obviously it gives 2,300 people a chance to have a voice, and it it provides us with kind of relative, so even if it's not generalizable, we can start seeing, okay, what are the factors pushing these values around? Can you do a percentage with adult possible accuracy on the community and not at all? No, not without a random sample type thing. Okay. Um, so I think now we're going to move on to our next question. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to our next question. Lisa, thank you very much. Uh, Let's uh, move on uh, and talk a little bit about our Parks and Recreation Department. I'm going to turn this over to Lynn here shortly, but I do want to reflect on the fact, first of all, that citizens uh, were very clear in the survey, uh, at least, that uh, we should continue to fund neighborhood swimming pools in a broader and perhaps more meaningful sense. The parks. Uh, repair and replacement budget altogether was uh, chosen by survey takers as the most important future funding priority. And it's not hard to understand why. Parks and Recreation Services plays a big role in public safety, community learning centers, recreation center programs, and sports all keep our kids and positive uh, activities and away from trouble. Parks and Recreation is important to our community health. It's a component there too. Trails, parks, sports fields all provide opportunities for the type of active lifestyles that improve health. Parks are important to uh, creating and maintaining a vibrant and livable neighborhoods. They help maintain property values and provide the amenities that make Lincoln such a great place to live and raise kids. And the trails uh, under the care of the Parks and Recreation Department are an increasingly important means of transportation for many Lincoln citizens. Regular repair and replacement of these capital assets are essential elements in the Parks and Recreation Department's uh, ability to uh, contribute to our quality of life. You simply cannot provide the programming that keeps kids safe, that supports good health, that maintains and strengthens the neighborhoods and moves people without maintaining the playground equipment, the rec centers, the trails, parking lots, and restrooms 
all of which support these programs. And believe me, as you can see from the charts on the wall, there are a considerable number of parks assets to maintain. 321 structures with roofs, including 79 picnic shelters and 37 restrooms, 89 playgrounds, 25 lighted ball fields, 66 backstops and seven recreation centers, 174 miles of recreation and parks trails, 560 park benches, 131 bridges, 97 park uh, drinking fountains, and over a thousand light poles, among other things. That's why my budget provides an additional $800,000 per year to nearly cut in half the $1.7 million gap between the annual cost of repair and replacement of these facilities and the projected revenues on hand. We have to do a better job of taking care of what we already have in the Parks and Recreation Department. Uh, and that's a major item in our 2016-18 uh, budget. So I've asked Lynn Johnson, the ABLE Director of our Parks and Recreation Department, to show us uh, what we will be able to do in the next six years of the city's capital improvement project, partially as a result of these additional funds. Our entirely you describe it <laughs> Happy to. good morning thank you mayor we take the responsibility for keeping lincoln's parks and recreation facilities in good operating condition very seriously four years ago we worked with the parks and recreation advisory board to develop a 10-year facilities plan uh, identifying projects and needed funding to keep our parks and recreation facilities in good uh, condition and open for public use. We plan to update this plan every two years and the most recent update was completed in 2015. An enlarged copy, all 10 pages, of the Parks and Recreation 10-year facilities plan is posted on the wall. Repair and replacement work is identified in 87 of Lincoln's parks. The 10-year facilities plan adopted by the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board indicates that about 2.9 million is needed annually for repair and replacement of existing facilities. Previously, about 1.25 million of funding for annual repair and replacement projects was available, leaving a gap of nearly $1.7 million a year. The mayor's proposed budget includes an allocation of an additional $800,000 each year. $400,000 from appropriate, for, pardon me, from allocation of additional uh, revenue from increased Keno play and $400,000 from general tax funds. This added revenue will allow us to increase infrastructure repair and replacement work uh, accomplished by about two thirds. For every $1 previously available, there will now be $1.67. Our goal is to replace 22 playgrounds over the next six years. Play area surfacing will be replaced in five parks. Funding will also allow us to address failing areas of pavement in parking lots and roadways that have been deferred for many and actually too many years. Uh, for example, at Woods Park, the parking lot there was last repaired after the 1997 storm. So it's been nearly two decades since we've been able to do any work on the parking lot in Woods Park. If you've driven through Pioneers Park, if you've driven through Holmes Park, if you've driven through Mahoney Park, you've also seen, or you will also see, unfortunately, areas of failing roadway. Some of Lincoln's trail system is approaching 40 years in service. We'll be able to replace sections of trails that are cracked and separating as they age. Six of our public pools are more than 50 years old. Uh, the funding will allow us to repair aging pumps, filtration systems, and piping so that pools are open for summer water fun. Park area lighting will be renovated in four parks. New roofs will be installed on Ald Pavilion, Hyde Observatory, and the Bethany Park Enclosed Park Shelter. Renovation of restrooms is planned in three parks, and funding is also provided for replacement of about 200 ash trees a year associated with our emerald ash borer response efforts. In summary, the added funds for repair and replacement of parks and recreation facilities will impact neighborhoods throughout Lincoln, helping to kids keep kids active and safe, supporting healthy lifestyles, and enhancing our, the quality of life in our neighborhoods. I want to stop and really emphasize this. This is significant. It's been nearly two decades since funding for Parks and Recreational Capital Improvement Program was at this level. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have this morning. Can you explain our um, going to, I guess, trouble for past budgets of not having enough 
It, it, it really means that we have to prioritize where the funding goes. So we're constantly sort of looking at what can we defer for a little bit longer. And to be perfectly honest, the area that we deferred probably most significantly was our, our parking lot paving, our roadway paving, uh, our sidewalk repair, our trail repair. Um, and we've gotten to the point that we've got to do something about it. Once the pavement starts to crack and break up, it's one of those that it's better to invest a dollar early on or else you've got to replace the entire system later on. So. We have tried to make sure that we are putting dollars into playground replacement, into, into places that really keep kids active and busy, but it's those um, uh, things that uh, probably have less of an impact on recreation but are very important for access that we have not been able to put money into. This new money really allows us to, to start to address some of those important priorities. And I see that you have a 10-year um, facilities plan. How did you come up with um, what to prioritize and what to do? Great question. Um, we have an inventory of all of the facilities that we have. We actually sat down with our maintenance staff and we reviewed on a site-by-site -site basis all of the infrastructure that's out there and identified areas that needed to be addressed. We took that information to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board so that they could review it and have input and then they were involved in prioritizing the work. So we really want, we wanted some community input helping provide guidance to us as to what they would consider to be the highest priority. So when you see the full plan, it actually has rankings of A, B, and C. We take that information and then we, we plug that into the six-year capital improvement program as we build it every year, every, every, really every two years. And I think you already talked about this, but if you could just reiterate, can you talk about how much the budget has changed over the years and how this increase is helpful? Like, where is it, like, can you kind of give us a ballpark Yeah, I can absolutely do that. Um, during the 1990s, there was about $2 million a year available for the Parks and Recreation Capital Improvement Program. It was really about a million dollars of general revenue at that time and about a million dollars of Keno revenue. Um, as the economy started to struggle during the 2000s, we saw that reduced to as little as a million dollars a year. And, um, and, uh, and then most recently, this funding will bring us back above $2 million a year in terms of funds that we'll be able to invest. One of the changes that we've made with the direction of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Board is that the $2 million that we had during the 90s was used for both repair and replacement and developing new facilities. The board has really said we need to focus on taking care of, of what we have. And so the $2 million that is in the budget today really is all about repair and replacement. It's really about taking care of what we have. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully we'll finally give you some money to work with. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right. That's it for today, and thank you for coming. And uh, uh, we really do appreciate your making the public uh, aware of what's in the budget so they'll better understand the debate about what should or should not be in the budget. So thank you.